Okay, and simple procedure, finally wrapping up Discovery. And I just want to finish up by talking about what kind of materials are discovered and just how they work. We've talked about these all throughout the last uh, few episodes and previously as well when we talked about uh, the scope and all that kind of stuff. But right now, I just want to sum up the actual... Oops, I apologize. The actual materials that can be discovered and... I might actually cut that out. I don't usually edit these, but that is going to be loud and annoying to your ears. So just uh, notice in this episode, uh, ignore all this part that I'm currently saying because uh, a loud noise it was just cut out because I accidentally banged the microphone against the table. But anyways, we're going to go ahead and talk about what materials are actually discovered. Uh, first going to talk about mandatory disclosure, second, interrogatories, Uh, third, uh, the request to produce documents, fourth, depositions and subpoenas, and finally, electronically stored information. So what is mandatory to be disclosed? The moment you get to discovery, what do you have to tell the other party? There's four things. First, the names and addresses of good witnesses. Uh, These are witnesses that are going to support your position. Uh, Second, any evidence that supports your claim or defense. Third, any damages that were there, medical bills, etc. And finally, who's your insurance provider? And the idea of this is to promote settlement uh, because if you give good information right away, you can see they've got a really strong case and you want to settle. Courts want to save as much expenses as they can, so it's mandatory to disclose early, the very first thing, so that you encourage settlement. If that doesn't happen, well, then you can go ahead and ask interrogatories. These are questions that you are simply asking to the other party. The questions are not to exceed 25 questions per document, and if you want any other additional questions to ask, you have to get leave from the court. Uh, Everyone asks these questions. Uh, They don't get too much additional information other uh, that's separate from all the other things. But it's a good starting point where you ask these questions, I can see what other documents I need to request uh, to produce and uh, who I need to depose, all those kind of things. Uh, the number one question that is actually asked on interrogatories is to list the name and addresses of all individuals who have relevant information about the case. Uh, So this is going to include good and the bad witnesses. Uh, So that's why that is the number one, because mandatory, you only have to share good. Interrogatory, if you ask that question, you have to share all. Third, the request to produce documents. This is going to be a very common request. Notice these are going to be copies of paper documents. This is going to be your paper trail. Uh, So other than documents that are automatically produced, the party can request additional documents that are relevant to the claim or the defense. In this request, the main requirement, in addition to all the regular discovery rules, is that the materials that are requested are described with reasonable particularity. Uh, say, this person had fraud. You have to say specifically, I want this, uh, this letter that was sent. Uh, describing this piece of information that was sent on this date. Uh, Reasonable particularity. Depositions and subpoenas. You can depose up to 10 people, I believe, uh, without additional leave from the court or additional permission from the other party. Uh, The party who starts uh, the deposition is going to be taking the deposition while the opposition defends the deposition. Uh, You want to keep everything on the record. That's just a little tip for practice, according to Professor Goggin. And the notice of the deposition is served onto the attorney of the other party, not the client or the witness. And importantly, the date and the time of the deposition is going to be relevant to... Well, it needs to be reasonable. It can't be scheduled over a wedding or a major holiday uh, because you you can't just look 
up their personal life and say, I know they can't make it that day, so I'm going to depose them this day, hoping that they don't show up. If the date and the time is not reasonable, well, then the parties need to get together to try and figure out a date that is going to work. And if it's not resolved, then you have a protective order against the deposition. So a subpoena in this situation is in order to come and testify. And then a subpoena, and I, I don't know the Latin, excuse me for not pronouncing this pr- properly. Subpoena ducis anticum? Some? Something like that. Uh, request, it, it, what that is, it's a request to bring certain informations and documents with them to testify. Subpoena is to testify. Subpoena ducis tecum is bring documents with you. And then finally, we have electronically stored information. This is, it, d- discovery used to be easy. Uh, you would request documents and it would be uh, sent over pretty quick. But with the expansion of technology, and especially email, a whole lot more information can be stored, a whole lot more uh, delicate information can be put on text and email, and let's just say it complicates the matter as far as retrieving, finding, and making it discoverable, but it is still available as an option. So those are all the materials that can be discovered, and that wraps up our discussions on discovery. We've talked about a ton. Uh, focusing on uh, giving an overview, the scope, uh, some of the privileges, um, and, and other limitations such as expert uh, expert witnesses. Uh, we've also talked about some of the ways that the courts have tried to encourage proper discoverable practices and the consequences related to that. And then we've talked about what materials are discoverable, and that was the... There's a lot that goes into discovery, but now we're going to be moving into summary judgment and how that works, trying to resolve issues before trial. And that'll be our next episode. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Law Schoolers. Before I let you go, there are four things I want to say. The first thing is if you enjoyed these episodes and if you enjoyed the website, I would invite you to go and join Law Schoolers Pro, and you can do that by going to lawschoolers.com slash join. It's a way for you to support us, but there's also a lot of features there that I think you will enjoy. Second thing is that nearly all of our episodes are unedited. The only ones that aren't are pre-law materials, and the reason for that is so you can actually see the legal material in its raw form as I'm learning it as well. The third thing is that the information contained in these episodes are specifically only for educational purposes. They're not to be used as legal advice. And with that, the fourth thing is if it is used as legal advice, we are not liable. That is, law schoolers is not liable for any legal outcomes. Thank you again for enjoying the show. Have a good one.